guys, it's Amy here, and today I'm going to be doing the time and place tag. So this tag was created by Jen at Jen Campbell, and I was tagged by Jean at Bookish Thoughts. I will leave both of their videos down below if you want to go and check those out. So the idea behind this tag is that everyone has those books on their shelves where they have specific memories of the time and place and stories that happened around the time of reading those books, and you're just meant to share them in this video. So I've got 10 books here, and I'm really looking forward to sharing my stories with you. So I'm going to try and go in a somewhat chronological order of when I read these books. The first book I have to show you is The Wind in the Willows by Kenneth Gray. I read this a lot as a child. I had it read to me, I read it myself, and I watched the TV show and the films. I loved it. It was my favourite story. I love the idea of woodland creatures being like humans, basically. My strongest memory of this book is being read it and being terrified as a child of the stoats and the weasels. If you read this book, you'll know that Toad's house in this story gets overrun by stoats and weasels with rifles and swords and they're all quite nasty creatures. A funny side note is that for a really long time, quite literally up until a couple of years ago, I thought that stoats and weasels were the same size as humans. I know, I know, I don't know why I thought this, I think it's probably because in the book I had already seen a badger, a toad, a rat, a mole, I knew what these creatures looked like in real life so I knew the size of them. But I had never seen a weasel before and in the book the weasels and stoats are the same size as all the objects and the house that they're in that they're taking from toad. So in my mind for some reason I just believed that weasels and stoats were capable of holding like a human sized rifle and that meant that they were the size of humans. And it was only up until a couple of years ago when my boyfriend pointed out a weasel to me and I was like, are you joking? That's tiny, that's not a weasel. And um, yeah, I was enlightened on that day that weasels are actually about this big. Not the size of humans. Disappointing. <laughs> so there's book number one. The next two books I have to show you are actually under the same reasoning for why I'm showing them in this video, so I'm going to show them at the same time, and they are His Dark Materials by Philip Pullman and A Series of Unfortunate Events by Lemony Snicket. Some of my fondest memories from middle school and learning to read independently are because of these books. These are definitely the ones that got me into reading and wanting to read books that weren't set by the school and things like that. I especially remember swapping the Series of Unfortunate Events with my grandma granddad because I remember he really enjoyed reading them as well and His Dark Materials was the first book I seriously remember my best friend giving me and saying this is a really good book you should read it and I read it and I loved it and it's one of my all-time favourite children's stories. Yeah these two were kind of together in the idea that they kind of got me into reading by myself. The next book I have and I'm sure in a lot of people's videos they will probably have some sort of Harry Potter book. My Harry Potter book is The Order of the Phoenix and the reason behind this is that it's the first book I ever pre-ordered and I had never pre-ordered any kind of book before. This was the first one that I did. A story that also pops into my head every time I pick up this book is an unfortunate thing that happened in school. There was a young boy who was in my class and he loved Harry Potter just as much as I did. I remember him coming to school. I'd already read the book on the day that it came out. He came to school maybe like the week after he was reading the book. He had it in front of him on the table, kind of like this, leaning down, looking over it. He was prone to having nosebleeds. Unfortunately, that very day, his nose started bleeding and it bled all over his Harry Potter book, all through the pages, and he just couldn't carry on reading it anymore because it was all covered in blood. It was equally one of the most hilarious and distressing things I've ever seen. Obviously he was really upset that he went through his book, but also it was just really funny because he just sat there and let it go from his nose to his book for quite a while before doing anything. So let's move on. But the next book I have to show you is The Lovely Bones by Alice Siebel. So you may have heard me mention before that I often speak with my grandparents and share books with my grandparents and we have quite a good bond over books. The book was given to me when I was around 11 or 12 by my granddad not the specific edition because the film hadn't come out yet then. The first book my granddad gave me that I was like what on earth? What is happening to the world? Because up until that point, everything had been somewhat light-hearted. I know the, the series of unfortunate events isn't particularly light-hearted, but it's still got that comedic kind of undertone to it. Whereas this book, I was completely, absolutely flabbergasted by. Like, I didn't know what was going on. It broke my heart. It made me think deeply about other things which I'd never thought about before. And it just completely shook me up. I haven't read the book in a very, very long time. It basically follows the story of a young girl who gets murdered and then she looks down from heaven and sees her dad who's trying to find out who murdered her and things like that. From what I remember, it was a really good read. I don't think the film was quite as good though. The next book I have to show you is somewhat in the same vein of books that kind of took me by surprise 
surprise and maybe think about the world. And it is The Curious Incident of the Dog in the Nighttime by Mark Haddon. This follows the story of a young boy with Asperger's syndrome who discovers one night that a dog has been murdered in his street and he sets about trying to work out who has murdered this dog. Obviously, this boy has Asperger's syndrome, so the book focuses a lot on different aspects of mental health and the way people see the world. It is written through his perspective, so it's quite different in the reading to many other books that I've read, actually. It was quite unique at the time when I, when I read it first. I first read this book when I was around 13 years old, and I remember it being the book that made me really think about other people and the struggles that other people have in their lives. It just basically made me stop thinking about myself for a minute. You may have seen my video back along of mental health book recommendations. I'll leave a link down below if you want to watch it. For some reason, I have read quite a lot of books where either the main character or one of the main characters suffers with some sort of mental health issue. I can definitely say that this is the book that started that off. So let's move on. The next book I have to show you is Twilight by Stephanie Meyer. I first read this when I was around 14 years old. And the reason I'm showing it in this video is not because I think this is a really great book that you should all go out and read, obviously. We all think very differently about Twilight now. I absolutely loved it when I was around 14. I loved all of the books, maybe not Breaking Dawn, but The Host, which is in the front cover here, I think The Host is a fantastic book and I am going to be rereading it this year because I absolutely loved it. Anyway, the reason why I'm sharing this in this video is because this is the first book that me and my best friend Rianne got really, really excited about together. I specifically remember our trip to town and Rianne picked this book up from Waterstones and I remember sitting on a bench outside Waterstones and her telling me all about it and saying that she was really excited to read it because she'd heard about it and there was just Twilight out at this point, no other book. So after she read it, she passed it on to me. I read it, fell in love, thought it was the best thing ever. From that point, as best friends, we got so excited about each book coming out and would share and talk about it together and I just loved it. Even though I don't think I would reread these books now, I still look at them on my shelf and just think of those happy memories, reading them with my best friend and just having a really good time during high school having these books around. Okay, so the next book I have to show you, or I should say a set of books, is the Lord of the Rings Folio Society edition and it's not necessarily the first reading of this book or the time and place that I read it, it's actually the time and place that I bought it because I've read Lord of the Rings quite a few times and I have a lot of editions of it. This is my most prized possession and the story behind me finding this is what makes me so happy when I look at it on my shelf. Basically I was on holiday with my family and my best friend Lydia in a little Cornish seaside town. One day we decided to go off on a steam train ride, it was kind of like Harry Potter, to another seaside town and we found this tiny little antique bookshop. Inside the bookshop was this Folio Society edition of The Lord of the Rings. So my mum spotted them and pointed them out to me and I thought, oh, these books are amazing. They're gonna be a lot of money. So I asked the guy how much they were. He said 20 pounds. 20 pounds! But then my dad, being the old haggler that he is, said, all right then, we'll give you 15 for them. And the guy in the shop was like, yeah, that's fine. 15 will do. If you've got cash, that's fine. And since that day, I've found them online and they are a hell of a lot more than 15 pounds. In fact, buying the paperback copies in Waterstones cost you more than 15 pounds. So I was very chuffed with this buy and that is why it is in this video because every time I look at it on my shelf, I just remember that tiny little seaside town and that guy in the bookshop who was just like, yeah, 15 pounds will do. So beautiful. I love them so much. The next book I have to show you, I don't actually have a copy of because I gave it away to someone else for positive reasons, not because I didn't like it. And that book is Oh The Places You'll Go by Dr. Zeus. You know what Dr. Zeus is? There are loads of different stories. The Cat in the Hat is probably one of the most famous. They're basically short little stories that kind of have a little moral with them as well. They're good for children but also really good for adults because they still have that kind of meaning behind them. So I was given this book as a Christmas gift in my first year of university by one of my university friends. She was very aware that I was having a really hard time and I was really struggling. I wasn't very happy at all. I didn't know where I was going in the world and it was just all a bit crap really. She gave me the book and told me that originally someone had given her the book because she was having similar feelings and it was something that really brightened her spirits. I took this flimsy children's book home and thought, you know, what is this? I'm not gonna read it. It's not gonna do anything to my mood. It's not gonna cheer me up at all. And then I read it and it was just simply perfect. It brought me to tears. It made me smile. It made me laugh. And by the end, I felt 
so much happier. The message of the book is basically to say that you may go through really hard times in life but you will come out the other end and we're all capable of moving mountains if we wish and it was just the best thing. As I said before I actually gave my copy away because I felt I knew someone who needed the story more than I did. I may rebuy the book at some point in the future but I don't think I need it right now. I'm very happy with everything but I know that that story is there if I need it to brighten my spirits again. Okay so we're on to the final two books and the first one I'm going to mention is Lord of the Fies by William Golding. Not because of the story because I didn't really enjoy this book but because of where and when I read it. So I read this book in my third year of university in my shared house and I read it with my friends Joe and Lydia. When I say read it with them I actually read parts of it to them. In our house our rooms were on three separate levels so Lydia is at the top, I was in the middle and Joe was on the bottom floor. In the evenings we would all kind of meet in the middle on the landing between all of our rooms and we'd just sit play on our phones, read books, do whatever and I just have this really happy memory of sitting reading Lord of the Flies to Lydia and Joe as they sat bundled up in blankets and pillows and all this cuddliness and we just sat there for a few hours as I read a good chunk of Lord of the Flies to them. Funny thing is is that I actually finished this book by myself so neither of them actually know what even happened in the end unless they read it themselves since then but I don't think they have. Moving on to the final book that I want to mention and it's actually a book that I read this year and I have done a review of it so I will leave that review a link down below and it is Reasons to Stay Alive by Matt Haig. I read this book on a train journey to London in April and absolutely devoured it. I thought it was fantastic and I still think it's fantastic. I know I will be rereading it some point this year. The reason this book had such a strong effect on me was because my granddad died in January and it was a really hard time. The first experience I'd had of somebody close to me dying and this book just really helped me through that I think. Even though it's not expressly about somebody close to you dying. It's actually Matt Hay telling his story of overcoming depression and if you watch my review of the book you'll know that I said in that video I actually suffer with depression and anxiety. So I read this book and it really helped me kind of come to terms with the death of my granddad and reasons to stay alive basically so it was just a really kind of uplifting read and I really think it's good if you suffer with depression or things like that to read positive stories of people who've recovered or things like that or just to talk to people about it basically like you don't even need to read a book like this to start discussions about depression and mental health and things like that because I think it's just really important to do so. So yeah that's my final book, a bit of a sad last one but there you go, sorry. <laughs> so those are all the books I want to talk about today, let me know down below if you have any stories about any of these books because it would be interesting if you have any connections with these books as well. I'm going to tell you Lorna from Suddenly Lorna, Frankie from Instead of Gold and Marlon from Marlon Alina. Hopefully you guys haven't been tagged already but I'd be really interested to see your answers if you want to film this video, I'd be really excited for it. As always I will leave links to Facebook, Tumblr, Twitter, everything down below. I hope you're all having a fantastic day and I will see you soon. Bye! Here's the next shelf down and it has American Gods by Neil Gaiman, Sense of Sensibility by Jane Austen, Rosie Project by Graham C, 